Hi, everyone. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Olga Maleva from University of Birmingham, who will explain why a generic Lipschitz function is extremely far from being differentiable. Olga, thank you for, for sharing. Hello, uh, and thank you for your kind invitation. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about Lipschitz functions and Lipschitz mappings. Um, and let me start. Uh, so, so I will mainly talk about finite dimensional case, and uh, I will say a few words about infinite dimensional cases, uh, but I will specify when uh, I decide to do so. Uh, in finite dimensional cases, it's, it seems that uh, Lipschitz mappings are very nicely behaved because we have the Rademacher theorem, which says that uh, every Lipschitz mapping from Rm to Rm is differentiable almost everywhere with respect to the Lebesgue measure. And uh, uh, we conclude from this that if we consider um, the set of points where it is not differentiable, then this is a small set. It has a Lebesgue measure zero. Now, uh, one of the natural questions that uh, people started to wonder about uh, quite some time ago uh, was, what if we start with a set, uh, with a prescribed set of Lebesgue measure zero, can we always find uh, a Lipschitz mapping or a Lipschitz function uh, which is not differentiable everywhere inside the set or maybe exactly uh, at the points of this uh, given set? Uh, now, uh, there was a result uh, by David Price in 1990, uh, and then um, uh, subsequently I had a number of joint papers with Michael Dorea and then with Michael Diamond, uh, where we actually show that uh, uh, if we talk about Rn um, with n at least two, uh, then uh, it is always possible to find a set, a null set, uh, for which uh, every Lipschitz, uh, real, real valued Lipschitz function will have a point of differentiability. And the same is true if we have uh, uh, real valued uh, Lipschitz functions defined on Aspen spaces, infinite dimensional spaces. Uh, now, uh, precisely, uh, what, how small this set may be. So um, this set may be chosen to be of Hauser dimension one, uh, could be closed and bounded, um, and even of Minkowski dimension one in the finite dimensional case. Uh, now, just to briefly say, um, original result by Price gave uh, the Hauser dimension one, but uh, not the closeness. So the set constructed um, in the paper by Price, uh, actually its closure was the whole space. And uh, uh, somehow this was an in intrinsic part of the proof. So um, we had to, to work a lot to, to make the set uh, much smaller so that uh, it is already closed uh, when um, we are talking about all these properties. Now, once we have these um, sets, which we call universal differentiability sets, um, we may look uh, at uh, the other sets, the non-universal differentiability sets. So these are the sets uh, for which we can always find a real valued Lipschitz function, uh, which will have no points of differentiability inside the given set. Uh, so what do I mean when I say that uh, some of them might be good? Well, uh, for me, a good non-universal differentiability set would be a set for which, although there exist Lipschitz functions uh, without any points of differentiability, but actually majority of Lipschitz functions or many Lipschitz functions uh, will have points of differentiability inside this set. Uh, and so the question that uh, we're going to discuss today uh, will be how to measure uh, this um, uh, notion of many. Uh, 
Right. Let me start from the easiest case uh, when uh, we actually consider functions from R to R, which seems to be uh, rather trivial, but uh, you will see that the, there are some non-trivial results al already in this case. So there is a, a theorem by Zahorsky, uh, uh, which says that if we start uh, with any null subset of R, then we will always be able to construct a Lipschitz function from R to R, which has no points of differentiability inside this set. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, and so every sub, every null subset of R is a non-universal differentiability set. Uh, and of course, vice versa, we have from, um, from Rademacher theory, let's say, or much easier uh, case here. Uh, now, slightly non-trivial uh, part of uh, this theorem is that uh, we don't we don't get equality. So um, there are uh, null subsets of R for which um, um, whenever F is nowhere differentiable on that set, uh, the set of points of non-differentiability will actually be bigger than the given set. But uh, I'm not uh, going in, in that direction. So for subsets of R, uh, this is rather easy. Now, uh, when uh, uh, the dimension of X is at least two, uh, uh, we already know that uh, any non-universal differentiability set must have Lebesgue measure zero. Uh, now, can we say anything in the opposite direction? So what kind of properties of S would guarantee that it is a non-universal differentiability set? So there are notions uh, such as poros and sigma poros, which uh, I'm not going to define here, uh, uh, but these properties do guarantee that um, the set is a non-universal differentiability set. So roughly speaking, uh, that means that um, around uh, every uh, point of the set, uh, um, on arbitrarily small um, um, scales, you are going to have uh, pores of uh, radius proportional to the distance um, between the center of that uh, pore uh, of that circle uh, that is outside of the set and uh, the point. But uh, as I say, I, I don't want to, uh, to enter into this. Um, uh, and it is known that um, such sets may have a uh, um, house of dimension uh, all the way up to and including n. So uh, we can see that uh, non universal differentiability sets may have uh, any house of dimension. Uh, now, if, however, we have a set with the small with a small house of dimension, uh, house of dimension strictly less than one then this guarantees that uh, this set is a non-universal differentiability because uh, if we simply project this set onto a line, uh, we are going to get uh, a set of, uh, again, house of dimension less than one, and house of dimension less than one inside uh, a line is going to be uh, a null set uh, subset of R, and then we can construct by Zaworski uh, a function from R to R Lipschitz function that is uh, nowhere differentiable in the given set. And then we lift this into the space and uh, get, um, um, get a mapping that is nowhere differentiable in the given uh, uh, subset of uh, um, Rn. Okay. Uh, Yes, and uh, uh, more generally, if uh, uh, we have uh, any subset of R of Lebesgue measure zero, and we take its uh, product with, uh, let's say, R and minus one, then we get an example of a non-universal differentiability set. Um, now, uh, we uh, actually prove that when uh, 
we are talking about uh, sets of uh, Hausdorff dimension equals one. If uh, the H1 measure is finite, then this is also uh, a non-universal differentiability set. But you can see from uh, from these uh, facts um, uh, that somehow we don't have a complete picture of this. So we can say a little bit here, a little bit there. And at the moment, we don't have uh, a complete geometric um, or measure geometric measure uh, characterization of uh, sets that are non-universal differentiability. Uh, and uh, uh, we we have some conjecture uh, about this, um, namely that uh, the collection of all uh, compact non-universal differentiability subsets, um, let's say of a cube, uh, is actually non barrel in the space of um, uh, compact subsets of uh, of the cube with the house of distance. And uh, somehow this explains why we can't uh, give a nice um, geometric description of, of this. Uh, but uh, again, this is a side remark, so to speak. Um, uh, so uh, I will now be uh, interested in, uh, in trying to um, answer first uh, the question about existence of good non-universal differentiability sets. So uh, when we are talking about behavior of many Lipschitz functions, um, we want to quantify this many or being generic or being typical. Uh, and so this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, now, what is a typical Lipschitz function? Um, well, for this, I will need to consider a topological space and to define what does it mean uh, that an object, uh, a point in the topological space is typical. Um, and I'm going to do this from the bare category uh, point of view. Um, so just to remind you, uh, we talk, uh, we, we say that uh, a subset of uh, topological space is nova dense if its closure has an empty interior. And then we are able to define subsets of first bare category uh, by taking countable unions of nova dense subsets. And uh, I'm saying that complements to the subsets of uh, first bare category uh, are called residual subsets of um, uh, of the topological space. And uh, so if I have a residual subset, um, uh, then uh, objects of this subset uh, are going to be called typical. Now, what kind of topological spaces am I going to consider? Uh, so I will consider uh, as, uh, as a topological space collections of uh, uh, Lipschitz functions or Lipschitz mappings uh, with constant bounded by one. Uh, and uh, I will consider both uh, uh, when uh, I have uh, the mappings defined on, uh, on a cube or on a bounded closed um, uh, subset. Uh, now, I actually don't consider in the results I'm going to present uh, cases when Q is unbounded. However, I should say that uh, there is a way to uh, to join this uh, with the case when uh, Q is bounded uh, by uh, uh, truncating basically uh, this Q by bigger and bigger balls and, uh, uh, and then uh, taking um, instead of soup norm, taking um, the series uh, and uh, uh, considering uh, this uh, as um, as a topological space. Uh, now, why do I consider these spaces? Uh, because um, um, any complete metric space is a bare space, and uh, in bare spaces, uh, the residual subsets are dense. So this is what I want to have. Um, I want, when I say that uh, a property is typical, I want uh, to have a subset of objects uh, which is dense in the given space. Uh, 
uh, now uh, the the spaces of uh, uh, Lipschitz one functions uh, or mappings um, and actually the space of continuous uh, mappings uh, with sub norm uh, bare spaces. So uh, we can uh, apply, um, um, we can tr try to find uh, residual subs uh, subsets there. Uh, now, if we talk about continuous functions, uh, then actually it's a very interesting result, um, which um, when I first met it, uh, I was quite puzzled that uh, a typical uh, continuous function is nowhere differentiable. So we all know this um, uh, example by Weierstrass, uh, where there is this series uh, and which constructs uh, a continuous function without points of differentiability. But actually, if we think uh, about, uh, if we approach this from the bare category point of view, then we actually discover that uh, almost all continuous functions have no points of differentiability. Now, of course, uh, this can't happen uh, ellipses functions, because we know that actually Lipschitz functions are differentiable almost everywhere, so they do have points of differentiability. Um, and uh, also, if we think about uh, universal differentiability sets, we know that uh, um, every Lipschitz function has a point of differentiability inside such set. So, uh, so to be more precise with our question, what we want to ask is whether there exist non-universal uh, differentiability sets uh, for which a typical Lipschitz function has a point of differentiability. Okay, so uh, to, to answer this question, let's revisit one dimensional case. And uh, uh, I will now show another uh, even more non-trivial result about one-dimensional case. So this is a theorem by Price and Tischer uh, from 94, uh, where they prove that for subsets, uh, for bounded subsets in the real line, uh, a typical leap one function uh, has no points of differentiability inside this given set, if and only if, uh, this uh, set is contained um, in a countable union of closed sets of Lebesgue measure zero. So when I'm saying countable union of closed, I will abbreviate this as F sigma. So F sigma subset of Lebesgue measure zero. And uh, uh, such sets uh, we are going to refer to as uh, typical non-differentiability sets. Uh, and uh, it turns out uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, the sets that are characterized by, uh, uh, by the fact that a typical uh, leap one function is differentiable at some point of the set, uh, these are practically uh, the sets that uh, can't be covered by an F sigma um, Lebesgue measure zero sets. And uh, these sets are going to be uh, referred to as typical differentiability sets. So uh, now if we want to try to do something in a higher dimensional case, not just about functions from R to R, uh, then we, the first thing we understand is that being coverable by a countable union of closed sets can't be the right condition in higher dimensions because uh, we have uh, that there are closed universal differentiability sets of Lebesgue measure zero. So uh, we have this condition uh, satisfied where instead of F sigma, I simply have closed, uh, closed subsets of Lebesgue measure zero. Uh, and still we have that every Lipschitz function has points of differentiability inside that set. Uh, okay, and, 
And the next thing, um, so, so we have been thinking about this, and the next thing we realized was that uh, the role of bad guys for um, differentiability of Lipschitz functions uh, or mappings in higher dimensions uh, is played by what is called uh, purely unrectifiable sets or purely one unrectifiable sets. Now, let me give you a definition. Uh, so we say that a set is purely one unrectifiable if um, it practically intersects every smooth curve by a set of length zero. Uh, now, I'm cheating a little bit here uh, because um, uh, we want to, to put some conditions. So, for example, this phi can't be um, just um, identical. <laughs> Right point. So, so we need to have some some kind of condition uh, to have that. Um, no, actually, in in this form, it will be it will be still true. If if phi is uh, is is a point, then uh, each one of this intersection is going to be zero. So we want to to have that uh, intersections with every curve uh, is um, is of length zero, uh, and we are going to also consider. Um, the notion of uniformly purely unrectifiable sets. So these are the sets that uh, can be put uh, in a bigger set, um, in, a, in an open uh, set G epsilon, uh, which will uh, intersect every smooth curve, uh, which goes more or less in the same direction um, uh, by a set of... Uh, uh, measure um, of length less than epsilon. So uh, if I can draw somehow here. So uh, I mean here, uh, obviously, if we have this set G epsilon, uh, then uh, the thing that we would like to prohibit is a curve which uh, uh, which goes round and round, uh, uh, and uh, and then uh, uh, the length. Could be uh, uh, could be big, um, but um, if we um, uh, if oops uh, sorry um, if we uh, uh, stipulate that um, uh, it doesn't change direction much, then uh, we get uh, a curve which uh, which will go nicely, uh, and uh, and then we want to have uh, that. Um, such intersections uh, all have um, um, length less than epsilon. Okay, uh, so uh, so with this, uh, uh, we were able to uh, uh, to prove uh, uh, the following theorem. Um, basically, generalizing, uh, getting. Um, uh, an extension of uh, of the earlier result by Price and Tischer uh, uh, that for subsets uh, of R n uh, a typical real valued uh, uh, function has no directional derivatives at uh, every point of the given set, if and only if the set is contained in a countable union of uh, closed purely one unrectifiable sets. Now, the, uh, the connection between um, uh, purely one unrectifiable sets and uniformly purely unrectifiable sets is that uh, uh, uniformly purely unrectifiable sets is very easy, well, is relatively easy to connect with differentiability properties. Uh, and uh, Maybe I, I should have uh, said it uh, when I talked uh, there, but uh, I'll show it here. So if you uh, if you think of a set uh, which is uniformly purely unrectifiable, uh, then you can fit this set inside this set G epsilon, and then uh, every uh, curve uh, phi. Uh, will intersect G epsilon by a set of length less than epsilon. And so taking 
intersection of all these g epsilons, because each of them contains e, we will get that the length of the intersection of phi with the set e is zero. So it's clear that uh, being uni uh, uniformly purely unrectifiable implies uh, purely unrectifiable. Now, the direction um, in the other direction is uh, uh, is less clear, and uh, there were some uh, statements that uh, this might be true, but uh, the proof hasn't appeared uh, yet. One thing that we know for certain is that if we have closed uh, purely unrectifiable set, then this is uniformly purely unrectifiable. So we will actually mostly work with uh, closed purely unrectifiable sets. And so because of this, for us, uh, it will be the same as uh, uniformly purely unrectifiable. Okay. And uh, yes, and so these are typical non-differentiability sets and uh, uh, a typical uh, real valued uh, function has a point of uh, um, of differentiability at some point in S, if and only if uh, the set can't be covered by um, a countable union of uh, closed purely unrectifiable sets. And these are typical differentiability sets. Now, uh, so let's let's answer the question uh, that we asked. Uh, so consider uh, uh, such a set. So what do I do? Uh, I uh, I construct a null subset of R, uh, which uh, 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 which is G delta. So it's a countable uh, intersection of open sets. Uh, and these open sets all contain uh, Q uh, inside zero one. Uh, so this set is Lebesgue now, and so we know that every set of this form is a non-universal differentiability set. Uh, however, I claim that this must be uh, this product S n must be a typical differentiability set uh, because. Uh, uh, it is a dense G delta set, and so it must be of second category, and so it can't be a subset of countable union of uh, um, closed, purely uh, unrectifiable sets. Uh, right, so, so these sets do exist. Now, what uh, else can we deduce from, uh, from this theorem? Uh, we can see that uh, the the second condition in each uh, uh, in A and B uh, are mutually exclusive. So either the set can or can't be covered, uh, uh, and so uh, it is enough to prove uh, these directions for for both typical differentiability, typical non-differentiability. Uh, but the other thing is. Uh, that that is interesting to understand is that actually uh, negation of one uh, half doesn't give you the other because if the set uh, uh, of uh, um, of um, the collection of Lipschitz uh, functions uh, is not typical for differentiability for example, then it doesn't have to, uh, th there shouldn't uh, be uh, automatically um, a collection, a generic collection of uh, mappings uh, that that are non-differentiable. So, uh, so basically we show that uh, uh, for every set, we either have that it is either a typical Lipschitz mapping is not differentiable everywhere inside the set, or a typical Lipschitz mapping actually has a point of differentiability. 
Uh, now, um, around the same time when uh, we proved this theorem, um, there, there was a preprint by Andrea Merlo where um, he considered um, uh, one Lipschitz mappings from uh, the unit cube into Rm uh, with M at least N. Uh, and uh, instead of full differentiability, uh, he proved uh, uh, for such sets existence of directional derivatives, uh, but to Rm. So uh, obviously we wanted to compare the two uh, results and uh, um, unfortunately <laughs> what, what we proved was that um, one has to be extremely careful when comparing such results because uh, uh, when we go between um, spaces of Lipschitz mappings uh, to Rm and real valued Lipschitz functions, uh, then we change the space of objects. And so if we have a residual subset in one of the spaces, uh, even if we consider a canonical projection, uh, of course, if we have, uh, for example, a one Lipschitz function uh, into Rm, then its first coordinate, for example, is a Lipschitz uh, function into R. Uh, but we do not actually get uh, that a residual subset is mapped into residual subsets of the um, of the new space. So uh, to put it um, formally, uh, uh, that there exists uh, a residual subset uh, in the um, in the space L one such that. Uh, uh, the inverse by uh, projection is actually a nowhere dense set in uh, in the space um, of functions going to Rm. So uh, at the moment, um, I still don't see exactly how these two results compare, but uh, what I'm going to, to do later will actually uh, give a result that somehow unites both, uh, both of these. Uh, okay. So um, once we have uh, such a result, uh, a question uh, that uh, we may ask is, uh, can a typical function be differentiable at a typical point? So we know uh, that um, um, there are subsets, the typical differentiability sets, uh, in which um, um, a typical Lipschitz function will have points of differentiability. And actually the proof somehow shows that there will be, uh, these, these points will somehow be in many, in many places, uh, but it doesn't answer how many of these points are we going to find. Uh, so we started by trying to, to actually prove that uh, it will be differentiable at a typical point, but we ended uh, with something completely uh, unexpected. So now I'm going to consider for a little while um, uh, mappings uh, between Banach spaces. So assume that we have uh, X and Y Banach spaces, a closed bounded subset uh, of uh, X, and uh, I'm trying to um, decide uh, what can I say about uh, points of differentiability of Lipschitz one uh, mappings from Q to Y, uh, or about their non-differentiability. Uh, so uh, just to reiterate what we have shown is that if we have uh, a set that can't be covered, uncoverable set, uh, a typical F uh, will have points of full differentiability. And here I put some details. So it will have points of differentiability along various curves that um, go uh, inside uh, this set. So uh, to, to measure how well uh, the, uh, the mapping F is uh, differentiable at a given point, uh, let's consider the set DF. So I consider all linear operators from X to, to Y uh, 
And uh, here, it's basically uh, the definition of differentiability with one important difference. Here, I'm dividing by R, and uh, I'm taking supremum over all U of norm less than or equal to R, instead of dividing by the norm of U. Okay, and then I'm taking limit, and I would like uh, uh, to consider all L for which uh, such limit is equal to zero. So somehow these are all um, uh, all linear operators that we may somehow regard as possible derivatives um, at this point. And uh, we can say for, for sure that if F is truly differentiable at X, then there will be only one candidate uh, for, for this DF of X. Now, what we have shown is uh, that uh, for any S uh, and any separable uh, W, I'll, I will explain in a second why we need this condition to take some W in uh, the collection of all bounded linear operators from X to Y, uh, there is a residual subset uh, of the space of Lipschitz one um, mappings uh, from Q to Y, such that uh, this typical uh, lip one mapping, uh, every F from this collection uh, has uh, the following property that the set of points in the given set S for which this DF is huge because it contains the whole ball uh, inside this W. So if we are forgetting about Banach spaces for a second and just think about finite dimensional spaces, then we can take basically W to be equal to, um, to the space of all uh, bounded linear functionals. So, uh, so in, uh, in residually many points uh, of uh, uh, of the given set, we are going to see that uh, we have all possible linear operators as uh, um, candidates for uh, for derivatives. So not only it's not differentiable, but it's spectacularly not differentiable. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, this B, BW is the closed unit ball of W. Now, uh, why why do I take uh, W to be separable? Because uh, we can't hope to get more than that uh, because DFX is always separable. Um, now, what, what it also gives is that uh, for each uh, S in the finite dimensional case, uh, a typical F uh, is going to be non-differentiable at a typical point and in the maximal possible way, as uh, I explained. And in particular, if we start with a typical differentiability set, even the whole cube, uh, we get that a typical one Lipschitz mapping uh, to any RM is not differentiable at a typical point uh, and in the most extremal way. Now, you can... Uh, uh, you can ask, how is that? Because we know that every uh, one Lipschitz mapping is actually differentiable almost everywhere, but sets of measure zero, of Lebesgue measure zero, may actually be residual. So this is not a contradiction. Um, and this is, this is actually what is going to happen, but uh, this will be uh, for every S, not necessarily for um, sets of positive Lebesgue measure. Now, if, however, we start with a non, uh, non differentiability typical non-differentiability set, then somehow this result uh, is a little bit weak because uh, it only gives us uh, this DFX equals uh, to the whole ball um, in the uh, linear operator space. Uh, it only gives us this at a typical point and not at every point. Uh, whereas previously we had the results that it is not differentiable at every point, but how 
um, how terribly non-differentiable, we don't know. Uh, and if we compare again with Merlo's result, um, uh, so he proved uh, that um, for a typical uh, one lip uh, mapping and every point uh, in the set, uh, the, uh, the set of um, such limits uh, will contain uh, the ball so in, in RM. So again, um, if we are thinking about directional derivatives, uh, then uh, somehow this suggests that we would like uh, to be able to replace this typical point by every point. And, uh, and so this is, uh, uh, this is what uh, we, we started to work on. And so uh, uh, the questions that we, we have been considering uh, were the following. Uh, so if we start with the typical non-differentiability set uh, in Rn, which is uh, a subset of a countable union of uh, closed or compact uh, purely unrectifiable sets. Uh, so first of all, are we able to replace typical non-differentiability at a typical point by such non-differentiability at every point of S? Uh, keeping uh, the requirement that it's uh, mostly uh, it's it's uh, non-differentiable in the most extreme way uh, the other thing is that in all uh, proofs that uh, uh, yes and this would uh, improve uh, both uh, our uh, uh, earlier results uh, and uh, and the result uh, by Merlo uh, uh, now, the other thing is, in all the previous considerations, uh, we were always considering Euclidean um, norms on the spaces. And uh, actually, uh, uh, the, the other norms, although they are, of course, equivalent norms, uh, because the constants of equivalence are, are, not, are not one, uh, and uh, here it is important that we keep uh, the Lipschitz constant, uh, the question uh, is whether we can get rid of this uh, condition of being Euclidean. Uh, and the last question is, can we get uh, this um, when uh, the functions or the mappings are defined on, um, uh, on some closed uh, bounded sets as opposed to unit cubes? Now, uh, before I give you answers to these questions, uh, let me tell you how are we going to prove that some subsets of a topological space are residual. So what we are using uh, is called uh, banach mazur game. And uh, this is the following thing. Uh, there are two players, player one and player two, uh, a topological space T and a target uh, set A. Uh, and the players choose non-empty open subsets of T uh, one after the other uh, using the following rules. So the first player chooses uh, an open, non-empty open set T1. Uh, then uh, second player chooses uh, its non-empty open subset V1 uh, and so on. And then the first player U2 inside V1 and so on. Uh, now, the aim of player two is to guarantee that the intersection of all constructed sets or the intersection of all VNs is a subset of A that was given from the start. And the aim of the first layer is to prevent this from happening. Uh, a very important theorem uh, says that uh, a subset A is residual if and only if player two has a winning strategy. So basically, to prove that some collections of functions um, are re residual, uh, we construct a winning strategy for the second player. And, uh, and this proves that um, uh, this collection uh, is, um, is residual. Now, uh, we can actually uh, construct um, a strategy that only uses goals instead of uh, any open sets. 
and this simplifies things um, because we are talking about um, spaces of Lipschitz functions, and so we naturally can see the balls uh, inside these spaces. So uh, the latest result uh, I would like to uh, mention uh, says the following. If we have a subset uh, in Rn that uh, is a subset of the countable union of closed, pure, and rectifiable sets, uh, and uh, the spaces Rn and Rm are equipped with any two norms, uh, then for a typical lip one function, uh, and every point x in uh, in the set S, we have this extremal non-differentiability that dfx is equal to the uh, whole ball um, of uh, linear um, of the space of linear operators from x to y, uh, and we actually uh, we are able to replace. Uh, this um, unit cube, uh, um, the the mappings uh, to be defined not necessarily on a unit cube uh, at the moment, because this is a kind of uh, work in progress. At the moment, we have this for every compact uh, subset of Rn that is Lipschitz retract of Rn, uh, but um, we're working on. Uh, um, Sort of uh, weakening this condition or maybe removing uh, this condition. So uh, yeah, let me let me make some comments about this. Um, uh, I I thought maybe I would have time to to say a few words about proof, but I'm not going to to talk about proof. I will just mention one result, one uh, approximation lemma that we are using in the proof. Uh, and uh, the the statement is as follows: If we start with a compact purely unrectifiable set, which is a subset of an open uh, uh, set, and uh, we have a prescribed linear operator T uh, and some theta, then we can find a Lipschitz mapping from X to Y uh, uh, such that. Uh, uh, the main thing is this, its derivative uh, approximates T at everywhere, almost everywhere um, on H, uh, and uh, its support is inside U. So somehow it goes uh, uh, to zero outside of U, but uh, inside U uh, and uh, inside some open subset of U, H, uh, it, it will go like T. Uh, now, the the problem that uh, we originally had was that we, are, we were not able to get an estimate of the Lipschitz constant of G uh, with the norm of T. Uh, the, I mean, if uh, you will see in the moment that uh, in the case when we have Euclidean norm, we actually do get this uh, estimate with the norm. Uh, but uh, in the general case, we were able to get an estimate with the, what we call cylindrical constant of, of T, uh, where this constant is uh, is given by, uh, by the following uh, quantity. So we consider uh, all bases uh, of uh, Y and uh, um, their, um, 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 respective uh, bases uh, in uh, Y star such that uh, W I star of uh, W J is delta I J. And uh, we consider expressions like this, uh, where we take the sum up to J and uh, consider the maximal um, quantity uh, for J uh, between one and M. Uh, now, uh, we we say that a basis in Y is cylindrical if, uh, sorry, the norm in Y is cylindrical if there exists a basis for which uh, uh, this quantity for J 
will always be less than or equal to the quantity for j plus one. Now, of course, if we have Euclidean norm, this will always be true. Uh, so Euclidean and any LP norms are cylindrical. Uh, now, why why is this uh, important? Because uh, then uh, this will always be less than or equal to the quantity when we have uh, uh, when we here have m, and uh, if we have m here, then the sum up to m is uh, simply equal to t. And so we get that uh, uh, the Lipschitz constant of G is less than or equal uh, to the norm of T plus uh, some small um, constant. Uh, so we decided to to find out something about this. So so we actually realized that if the dimension of Y is one or two, then any norm is cylindrical, but uh, if it's at least three, then this is no longer true. Now, why did we call this cylindrical? Because uh, this property that uh, I stated on the previous slide is equivalent to the fact that if we add uh, next vector, uh, then uh, the the section by of the unit ball by the uh, hyperplane going through uh, W1 to WG plus one uh, is a subset of the cylinder on the uh, section on the previous hyperplane um, uh, with the unit ball. And, uh, and it turns out, uh, uh, and we calculated this, uh, that um, even in R3, you can construct um, a polytope now a centrally symmetric polytope now of course uh, any norm is a centrally symmetric body so centrally symmetric polytope uh, for which uh, every um, every uh, two dimensional section uh, is not going to be uh, a cylinder um, it, sorry a cylinder or on any two dimensional section is not going to contain the whole body. Uh, and, um, and this means that, uh, uh, that uh, this norm uh, is not cylindrical. Now, we are able to, uh, uh, to finish the proof without, uh, without um, uh, getting uh, this, this estimate uh, with the norm of T. Uh, but uh, I'm wondering, actually, whether this um, uh, approximation lemma uh, is is actually true uh, with a better estimate. So at the moment, this is uh, uh, this question is open. So I'm going to stop now. Sorry, I think I've taken a bit too much. Thank you very much, Olga, for a very nice talk. I really, I really appreciate it. Um, are there any questions? So it doesn't, doesn't seem like it. Um, could you actually say a few words about the proof? Yeah. So uh so first of all, why do why did I want to have here uh norm of t? Uh the reason for that is that uh my proof is going to go via banach mazur game. And so if I have um, if I have a turn of the first player who supplies a Lipschitz function and a ball around that Lipschitz function, I'm going to find uh, a smaller ball inside that one uh, for which uh, I, I would like to guarantee some properties. And so, uh, so when I do these kind of approximations and I construct new functions, I would like to guarantee that I'm still within uh, leap one functions so that I do not uh, shoot out of, of my space. So this is this is the important uh, consideration. Uh, now, uh, when when we think that we want to to get um, 
to get a residual subset uh, uh, of uh, mappings uh, uh, for which um, there is going to be this extreme non-differentiability, uh, it is actually enough to show that there will be a residual subset of uh, lib one mappings for which uh, we are going to have every prescribed T uh, as uh, in in this uh, set DF, because afterwards we simply take countable intersection of residual subsets uh, uh, over uh, a dense subset of uh, of linear operators in the finite dimensional case, and uh, and we get um, still a residual subset. So uh, so we always think about a fixed linear operator, and we would like to make sure that uh, we can construct. Um, a Lipschitz mapping that uh, is going to see this particular linear operator T uh, uh, as uh, as a possible candidate uh, for derivative uh, around each point of the given set. So, uh, so this is this is the approximation lemma which I've just uh, uh, stated. And uh, as I said, uh, we only have this uh, inequality. Um, uh, which could give something bigger than the norm of T. So even if we start with the operator of norm one, we could get uh, a Lipschitz function or Lipschitz mapping with uh, with constant bigger than one. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the next step would be uh, to prove that uh, if we have uh, if we have a situation like this, like we have here uh, with some mapping, um, and here I, I put a little bit more uh, general, uh, some psi of x uh, times t, then we can smooth out this uh, Lipschitz function so that uh, we get um, another Lipschitz function close to f, uh, still with this condition, and which is C1 uh, on some open uh, neighborhood of the um, of the um, compact uh, purely unrectifiable E. Now, this we do uh, uh, using convolution uh, with the standard uh, mollifier. Um, and here we actually even don't attempt to estimate the new Lipschitz constant. So it may again increase, unfortunately. Uh, now, the next step is, um, uh, is is uh, if we are given uh, this uh, compact purely unrectifiable set and uh, we are given some phi, um, uh, a continuous function uh, with uh, um, values between zero and one, then we can uh, find um, a Lipschitz function, uh, which uh, 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 Lipschitz mapping, uh, which which satisfies uh, this condition dg. Uh, is approximately, when I say approximately, it means that the norm of difference is smaller than a given uh, constant or given uh, quantity, um, is approximately psi of x times t, where psi is a uh, function between zero and phi, uh, which coincides with phi on this open neighborhood. Uh, now, this, this is uh, a combination of the first two steps. Uh, and so again, uh, by doing so, uh, we may have um, uh, Lipschitz mapping, which which has rather big uh, uh, constant. And um, and finally, important step is that uh, if we now have uh, a sequence of uh, uh, linear operators and a sequence of continuous functions, uh, we can apply the third step. Uh, uh, to get uh, some functions, elliptic functions in GK. And then if we take uh, this sum, uh, uh, what we can uh, notice here is the following. If we uh, have this additional condition that supports of phi k are all inside this open uh, set H0, uh, then this condition of psi less than or equal to phi uh, uh, and uh, the support of G is a subset of support of phi will give us that uh, the new function will coincide with F0 outside of H0. 
and uh, its derivative is going to be, roughly speaking, uh, derivative of F0 and summation of what uh, the derivatives of GKs are. And these are given by this psi k times tk. Um, and there is some additional condition which uh, I, I wouldn't comment on. So, uh, yeah, so this is the fourth step. And so in order to find the final function, the response of, um, of player two, uh, we start with the leap one function f, and um, we actually assume that its Lipschitz function, its Lipschitz constant is uh, strictly less than one, and the operator t of uh, norm less than one. Uh, we take a small neighborhood of E, uh, uh, which is uh, still inside H uh, as union of both. And then we take uh, a smooth partition of unity uh, subordinate to this uh, uh, to these walls. Uh, okay. Now I take very specific uh, uh, sequence of operators T K. So every um, odd numbered T uh, is going to be minus derivative of F zero at the center X K, and uh, every even is going to be just T. And the functions phi to k, phi to k minus one will coincide with uh, uh, with the gamma k um, coming from this partition of unity. So now, uh, uh, now what what is uh, the derivative of uh, f n? So it's the first term is d f zero, and then we have the summation uh, of uh, c k x t k. So for uh, odd numbers we are going to have C2K minus one times minus DF zero of XK. And for even, we are going to have plus side CK times T. And now I can re-decompose this in the following way. So I will put this, uh, I will put this as uh, side two K minus one times DF zero minus at x minus df0 at xk. Uh, so I have added all these terms, uh, um, these products. I will now need to subtract this. Uh, so this is where I'm subtracting this. And uh, I have this df0 at x. And finally, I have the third term. Now, the very first, uh, uh, term is is actually uh, because f zero is c one. Uh, this is how we are using tau, so that uh, uh, all these norms are small, and so then uh, the norm of the very first uh, sum is going to be small. And now uh, uh, these two uh, linear operators they both have norm less than or equal to one. Uh, and uh, we show that actually uh, these two coefficients uh, that are being mul multiplied by them are both non-negative and their sum is, um, is less than or equal to one. So we have uh, a convex combination of two things uh, that are of norm less than or equal to one. So we get uh, that, uh, uh, this uh, DFN uh, of X is uh, of norm less than or equal to one uh, everywhere uh, inside H0. Uh, but outside H0, uh, it simply coincides with F0, which is Lipschitz one. Uh, so we have uh, uh, in, in, in total, we have uh, a mapping that is uh, uh, of Lipschitz uh, of Lipschitz uh, constant less than or equal to one. And so the response of player two is going to be limit of these functions. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, so uh, we, we, are, we prove uh, that uh, if we have uh, a C1 function, C1 mapping, uh, then uh, we can uh, approximate it, it um, uh, we can find always a constant such that every function that is sufficiently close to G uh, will satisfy uh, 
this condition. Uh, and again, um, this is this is what we want. So instead of norm y here, I have uh, this delta. And so this allows us to determine which radius uh, player two uh, is going to to choose. Uh, and uh, the, finally, uh, to to justify uh, the step of the game, uh, uh, so uh, we know that we have constructed uh, Lipschitz one mapping. We know how to construct the radius. What remains is to show that uh, this limit uh, of this f to n is going to have um, a t as a candidate, as a good candidate for derivative around every point of the set E. Uh, so if I uh, recall this uh, formula, which I had on the previous slide, and I subtract T from this, then uh, we can see that actually, if we take K uh, big enough, then, uh, uh, then uh, first of all, uh, on the set E, all psi K will coincide with phi K. And uh, the summation of uh, finitely many phi K will already give one because uh, this is approximation, of, uh, this is partition of unity is locally finite. So uh, it will uh, uh, become one. So this term will, will actually be simply zero and there will be nothing in here. Whereas this one will be one. And so this will be one multiplied by T and here we have minus T, so this will cancel out. And the only thing that remains will be this small uh, uh, small thing, which, uh, yeah, I need to see this. Uh, uh, so we are going to get that uh, the derivative of the limit function is going to be approximately T at all points uh, of, uh, uh, of E. And so uh, then if I look at this, uh, it means that I can replace this dg by t, and this is what I'm getting, that uh, uh, the limit function, uh, the function that is going to be in the intersection of all the balls, because I'm thinking about this game, is going to satisfy this on arbitrarily small scales, uh, and it will have the property that h of x plus y minus h uh, minus t of y uh, is uh, is smaller than um, than a constant which which tends to zero and so um, and so we uh, we win the game for the second player and uh, this proves uh, that uh, uh, for residually many uh, Lipschitz one mappings uh, we are going to have T as a good candidate for differentiability at every point from the given set E, uh, and uh, um, because, as I say, this is going to happen for every uh, linear operator T, we take the intersection, the countable intersection, and we get a residual collection of uh, Lipschitz one mappings that are um, that that have every possible um, linear operator as a good candidate in the uh, in the differentiability uh, expression. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, well, uh, thank you again. Then I'll, I'll 